This, this next and last section is about agorism versus partyarchy. From my experience, many libertarians are familiar with the term agorism, but not as many are familiar with the term partyarchy. Um, and I haven't done actually, an official. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, great. Is... Well, I'm glad I get to. I'm glad I get to uh, reach one more person and the viewers with these uh, these words. So I'm going to use do my best to put them into my own words. I feel like I'll get really close to accurate. So agorism. Since I'll start there, since we already know what that, most of us already know what that is, is a way of dismantling the state. They're both forms of dismantling the state. Agorism is a way of dismantling the state by removing oneself completely from the state. And partyarchy is the end goal is to dismantle the state, but to use the methods of the state to get to that point. So a few characteristics that's common with agorist is civil disobedience, uh, like Martin Luther King Jr. had uh, preached a lot about. Um, counter-establishment economics, which is basically a fancy name for the black market. Many uh, agorist libertarians will engage in counter-economics so that they're not funding the state through taxes. Um, and then the last, uh, my last part of the description for an agorist would be someone that refrains from vote voting because voting is a state construct of itself and to engage in voting is to engage in state operations, which would be against their ethics. So, and then partyarchy would uh, basically be this uh, party, people that support partyarchy support dismantling the state by voting libertarian politicians in office to dismantle the state for them. So that's how I would describe the two. Um, but I would like to break them down into three different sections, the civil disobedience, counter-establishment economics, and voting. So to begin the discussion, have you ever engaged in civil disobedience? Uh, yes, actually. I, I don't know if you've seen the recent video. We've done it twice now. Uh, actually, the, a group has done it about five times, but I participated in the last two. It is illegal in Dallas, Texas to feed the homeless without a license. And so uh, maybe we can pull up a, a quick clip from that video, but uh, we literally do exactly that. We all strap on guns and rifles. We march down to downtown Dallas and we make, we make a big show of feeding the homeless, and we sort of dare anyone to stop us for multiple reasons. I mean, for, first of all, it's also illegal in Houston, Texas, and there are groups that attempted to do that without guns, hint, hint, and were thrown in prison for trying to feed the homeless without a license. We do it with guns, and we get left alone. I think that's a pretty loud statement on the Second Amendment in and of itself. But uh, absolutely, I participate in civil disobedience. Do you have a, do you have a quick... Uh, quick clip of that. Uh, pull it up one sec. All right, go go ahead. Yeah, so uh, it's a bunch of people. We, I mean, we fed probably three hundred people that day, uh, in spite of the law, uh, and everyone was armed, and not a single person was hurt, and we did a lot a lot of good that day. And then we went out later that night and gave tents to the homeless people that were literally sleeping on the concrete. Like we would walk by, and there are people. I, before I did this the first time, I really didn't know. Like, you don't know. I mean, you know that people are homeless and they sleep outside, but you don't, you don't internalize, you don't really understand what that means. But there are literal humans literally sleeping on the concrete. And we went out at night in the freezing cold, I, in, in temperatures I couldn't even, I, I really would have before that day thought that you would just die if you attempted that. And we gave them tents for them to sleep in. And uh, yeah, we, and, and that was 100% illegal and we 100%, you know, ethics are way more important than the law. Is this the video? Is it ready to view? No, I was just... Was yeah, I, I can play the audio, but I was just oh, okay. kind of showing the little clips of, you know, all the stuff that was going on as far oh, as... We'll link it in the description. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, we can link it there. But, you know, you got everybody... Okay, you know, great. There's all this stuff as far as where people are setting up shop and handing out food, all kinds of stuff. There's the music. Amazing. So a question about that event specifically with you engaging in that form of civil, civil disobedience would have would have there ever been a hypothetical line in the sand that if the state passed this certain line, you would have pulled your pulled out, said abort mission. Um, if so, what would have that line looked like? My mission, when you choose to have children, I think your mission in life has to change to be about them. 
Uh, if you're going to create a life, if you're going to put that life into the peril that is existence in the current state of affairs, your mission has to change to try and make the world the best place you possibly can for them. So my line, my last stand would be somewhere around my, kid, my kids and their safety and their ability to exist. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think that's beautiful, very touching. Um, I wanted to ask that question so that our viewers can hear an idea, like a guideline um, um, that they can see what you're doing and, and follow your example of where you would draw the line um, of the state's intrusion and your um, uh, self-preservation. So the next question regarding civil, di civil disobedience, how would you discuss the importance of civil disobedience with a partyarchy libertarian? Can you give me like a one sentence, what's a partyarchy libertarian? I, I kind of lost Absolutely. Um, it's okay. So a partyarchy libertarian would support the end result of dismantling the state, but the means of dismantling the state would be through political power, as, such as voting in libertarians into office and then letting those libertarians uh, sign or not sign legislation that dismantles the state. I think you first have to acknowledge that there is no mechanism that can be a, uh, there's no lever that any politician can pull all the way to the president himself that would end the state. That lever literally does not exist. The most you could ever get is a reduction in this or a little less of that. Uh, and I think if you look at history at all, uh, all attempts at some kind of incremental reduction in government have been an utter failure. Uh, and we can go back to Rothbard. Uh, Rothbard did an amazing analysis of uh, the, su the success of the Marxists and socialists uh, over the last 30 years. Who's been more successful, the conservatives or, or the socialists? I think our society has pretty much in every possible metric moved towards socialism over the past 30 years. And so he examined why that was and the, and the, and the levers that they're trying to pull. And it has nothing really to do with uh, winning office and, and pulling levers. It has everything to do with standing on what they consider their principle. Uh, you know, you have the right, they don't, they don't say, you know, elect so-and-so so we can go in and give us, uh, you know, um, free medical care. They say, you have the right to medical care. And anybody that tells you you don't have that right is evil. They speak the language of ethics and principle. And then people follow that. And, uh, and I think that's what libertarians need to do a lot more of because like, this, was the, this was the problem, this is the problem with Kokesh's campaign and the, the same problem with mine before I changed to the Declaration of Individual Independence. Um, as libertarians, we should not be telling people that the way to achieve freedom is to vote. The, voting is a meaningless, immoral, invalid process to decide who controls you. Um, because it lacks consent. Whether or not you vote, the system will control you. That means it lacks consent. That makes voting, you know, at best, like, uh, just like sullying yourself uh, with, uh, with, by, by playing an immoral game. Um, and if you believe in, if you, if, if, if you agree with Mises and with the most basic libertarian idea that you are responsible for the effects of your actions, uh, you own your body and the things that you use your resources to achieve, you also own. You own the effects of your actions. If you choose to take positive action in the world in the form of a vote, if you choose to use your human action to assist a politician in winning power over other people, invalid power, but power nonetheless, then you are responsible for the effects of that action, at least to some degree. That makes that makes you culpable for the effects of your vote. And a lot of people call, you know, voting as violence is a dangerous leftist idea, Adam Kokesh. It's, it's just owning the effects of your actions. If you take actions in the world and those actions have effects, real world effects on people's lives, and if those effects are evil, if you're violating people's consent, if the effects of your actions are violating people's consent, you are partially, if not completely culpable for that crime. So if voting violates people's consent and you took the positive action of voting, you're partially culpable for that as well. So therefore, who is safe to vote for? 
I don't know of anyone. I, I didn't vote on, on because I, I, I was scared. There's no one safe to vote for that won't violate morality. Because if I vote for Trump to keep Hillary out, well, Trump has bombed a lot of children. He's, well, you know all the stuff he's doing. I, I would have, people are literally culpable for helping that happen. Granted, they're not culpable for helping Hillary's evil happen, but they are culpable for, hap for helping Trump's evil from happening. So is it even possible? Is there even an option to vote for that doesn't make you culpable for some crime? And that's what I'm trying to do with my not governor campaign. I'm trying to see if it's even possible to provide people an option that violates no one's consent. Because if you can't find a non-consent violating option, please don't vote. Don't make yourself culpable, uh, co-conspirator to those crimes, especially not while calling yourself a libertarian. That's, that's, that's uh, self-contradictory or you become a hypocrite. Oh, we believe in not violating anyone's consent, but I'm gonna vote for this politician who is actually going to violate a bunch of people's consent. Did that answer your question? <laughs> it partially. <laughs> well, and, um, ask, I'll, ask I'll, what I'll, I missed, and I'll try again. Sorry. Um, I'll add a little bit and reiterate. I think it's. I think everything was great for discussion. So, if one of my friends wants um, a service and I refer a company to do that service for them, then that company does a terrible job. I'm at least partially responsible for referring that company to my friend in the eyes of my friend. So I can understand where you're coming from whenever you say that people that vote for uh, bad politicians that are put that are using force and things of that nature, then they are at least partially responsible. So considering that there is no lever in government to abolish government, then would you say that civil disobedience is pertinent to dismantle the state? Yeah, I think, uh, I think people have recently said, uh, and you can check out my Larkin interview for a discussion on this. Um, some people have said, but politics, it, it is possible to get some measure of freedom using the political process. And they used uh, weed legalization as an example of that. My response was that, no, politics did not grant more weed freedom. It was the mass public ignoring the bad laws, doing it anyway, telling their friends, sharing it with their friends, talking about it, demanding the freedom. And politics followed because the government has to at least maintain a veneer of consent of the governed. And if they, if they go against the mass will of the people too much, then people start to see behind the curtain. Uh, so politics did not provide weed freedom. The people just did it and demanded it and made it happen. And the political ruling class, you know, said, oh, okay, well, we better do this. Just like with uh, alcohol prohibition. So is there any size of civil disobedience that is not impacting? So I'll give you an example of something I think I understood correctly today. It seems so so minute that it just I, I couldn't have read it right but it is from what i understand people are marching or, or walking without shoes on without flip-flops on they're doing it barefoot i think it's called the barefoot march and they're doing it because it's a crime to drive a car without uh sandals or shoes of any form on uh, on the really? feet the reasoning really? behind that is because the yeah, the reasoning behind that is because brake pads, or the brake uh, pedal can get really, really hot and cause an accident if you can't press the brakes. That's the, the, the status logic behind that law. Um, so the question is, um, would that be an example of fighting a law that is so minute that it's a waste of time to engage in that civil disobedience? Um, and if so, how, like, how big should someone start? And if not, how, how little should someone start? Hmm. I, it is a total personal aesthetic preference. There isn't a moral should. So let's leave that alone for right now. It's not like you have a moral obligation to resist. No victim ever has a moral positive obligation to resist. That said, I roll stop signs quite frequently, and I especially like to do it when I have a car full of blue pillars. They're like, oh, you just blew through that stop sign. I'm like, yeah, there's no one around. There's no victims. It's a dumb law. You know, I, I shouldn't be attacked for that. If people are getting attacked for not wearing shoes in cars, 
imagine what a, I mean, that's like a marketing campaign ready to go. Like, <laughs> want to be safe? Like, the cops will literally, ostensibly, to keep you safe from barefoot driving, they will attack you and rob you for doing that. They're handing us those sales pitches. So, is it too sm Like, rolling a stop sign is a great example. Even when there's no one in my car, a lot of times I'll roll a stop sign if there's no one around, because if there's a victim, it actually becomes a crime, right? Uh, but if there's no victim, I roll the stop sign, maybe some neighbor sees it happen. Now, I, you know, most people would probably be like, the, you know, lawbreaker, <laughs> that criminal. Uh, you know, I wish there was a cop around, and a lot of people would even call the cops on something like that. But um, do I think there's anything too small? No, because even if no one sees it, you in your own head are flexing the muscle of I own myself, I own my body, I maintain agency over my property, and I'll use it however I want. And so if not wearing shoes while driving, you know, flexes that muscle, do it, man. Do it. <laughs> In the spirit of devil's advocate, wouldn't getting caught by the police engaging in civil disobedience be counterproductive to the agorist movement? Because once a police officer catches someone engaging in civil disobedience, the next step is handcuffs, the next step is court, and the next step is fines. So the, or murder, the person now becomes level of a criminal. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. But if the person does is uh, required to pay fines, then those fines go to the state. So would it be a counterproductive movement to engage in civil disobedience and get caught by the state? So you briefly said there something that made it sound like the victim was culpable for the money going to the state, which is absolutely not the case. You can never victim blame in that way. You, an example of that scenario would be if you own a dark alleyway and you, you have the right to walk down your dark alleyway, it's yours, and you get robbed, and they take your money and go do awful things with it. You're absolutely in no way culpable for the crimes of that thief. Day two. It's still your alley. You still have a right to walk down that alley. It's yours. Same thief shows up, robs you again. You are still not culpable for those crimes because it's your property. You have a right to do that. So if barefoot driving, barefoot driving is absolutely something you have a right to do. And that's just another way of saying no one has the right to use force to stop you. Then you're never culpable for the crimes of the state when they choose to rob you for that. Now, practically, is it good? Like, so like uh, Adam Kokesh uh, marched in Washington, D.C. with a shotgun and had his house raided and did a lot of prison time, which removed him from the activist community for quite some time behind that. And during that time, he was pretty much ineffective as an activist. Larkin Rose spent a year in prison for uh, resisting uh, theft in the form of taxes by the government. During that year, he was basically invisible and not really effective as an activist, I would argue. Some people might disagree. So... It's a personal decision. How do you want to resist? How much are you willing to risk? Is what you're risking really worth it? Is it practical? What's the most effective way? I think these are really personal case-by-case -case decisions that you, know, you kind of have to make for yourself. I think this is interesting because it, this conversation somewhat turned into a class for civil disobedience. We're not necessarily telling people specifically where to disobey and how to disobey, but it's good to have these discussions because people can hear that we are weighing our responsibilities with our possible outcomes and what is important to us. And I think it's good for people to hear that we have um, inner measuring mechanisms to decide what's best for us and our community and how to engage in civil disobedience most effectively. Um, before I continue to the next, though, do you have anything else you want to add about civil disobedience? I would just say, you know, a great thought experiment is always to, to try out the other extreme. So we're talking about the smallest ways, you know, is it practical in these tiny ways to be an activist? Well, what are some other extremes? What are the hugest ways you could technically consider, you know, to be being an activist that might be so extreme that they would have instant devastating repercussions and would those be practical or worth it? So one extreme example would be consider the ethics of a traffic stop. You have a person using force, threatening you with deadly force if you escalate to pull you over on the side of the road for a victimless crime. Ethically, are you in the right to use force to defend yourself against that person's initiation upon you? Absolutely. Ethically, you are. 
How much force can you use? As much as you need to, to defend your person or property. You know what I mean. You know what I'm saying. Now, is that response, which would certainly make news, likely end up in the immediate ending of your life, if not in, you know, in the near future, is that activism on that scale effective? I don't think it is. I think it's counter effective. I think it's, I think it hurts uh, the cause because the, the, the general public, the blue pillars would, would see you as a, an, as an extremist and you would sully the name, the labels that you carry, you know, just like uh, with the, the recent shooting, uh, the, the, every, after every shooting, everybody always goes and digs through them to try and figure out, were they a Democrat? Were they a Republican? Were they a communist? You know, like they always try and figure out what labels they operated under so that they could associate that, that deed with that label. And so while you would be ethically justified in using deadly force to defend yourself if necessary in a mere traffic stop, I think it would be an absolute bad form of activism. Just an interesting thought for you. Well, and just just before we go on here, while we were talking about like how far should you take like the idea of driving barefoot, uh, well, I just did a quick little Google search because I've heard about this exact thing before. Did you know that flimsy footwear in the UK causes 1.4 million close calls and accidents each year? So it's actually yeah. safer to drive barefoot. So it's actually practically, <laughs> practically, would you rather get a fine or practically would you rather have a close call or get into a car wreck because you're using the wrong kind of footwear to drive, right? So that that's something to consider as well because not all of these laws are for your good, but sometimes it's actually to your to your detriment, mm. right? Like – you know, forcible disarmament. That might be to your detriment if mm -hmm. something bad were to happen, right? So mm -hmm. that's, I just wanted to throw that out into the space as well. I'm glad you did. So you were, you were discussing with Mr. Smith about um, uh, defending ourselves during a traffic stop and how that would be a very radical form of civil disobedience. And then there's the uh, driving barefoot, which would be a much less radical form of civil disobedience. And it seems like you're saying that you can't go too small, but you can go too too big, too too radical, that that wouldn't help the movement. Um, is, is there a way to more definitively draw the line between too big and just big enough? Like, no, where would Goldilocks be? I, I don't think that's what I said. And if I did, I, I said it wrong. I, I said it's a personal choice. Uh, and, and I have preferences on what I think, and I have predictions on what I think will be the most effective activism and what will be, you know, less effective or diseffective, uh, or, you know, opposite of effective. Um, but it's a personal choice. Uh, and I will never victim blame. You know, if, if, if you go off and defend your life in a traffic stop, I'll be like, well, that cop asked for it. It was a victimless crime. He shouldn't have done that. Um. I, I, will, will, I will mourn your loss and wish you had done it differently the same way I mourned Adam Kokesh's abduction and caging for what he did. Would I w march in D.C. with a shotgun? Uh, no, because my personal judgment on the cost-benefit ratio on that act, uh, I mean, you have to look at, okay, what, what benefit did Adam get out of that activism and, and uh, you know, a loss of a year of his life? I'm not sure he got enough out of it. So me personally, it's a personal judgment call. I, I probably won't be doing that particular path. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I love that your philosophy of individualism applies in every aspect, every question, every decision that would be made. It's, it's up to the individual for them to judge of cost benefit and, and to make a decision from there. Um, so if it's okay with you, I'm going to continue to the next question. Yeah, do it. <laughs> 